Senate uh, Energy and Utilities Finance and Policy Committee uh, meeting of uh, March 29, 2022, to order, uh, and we have a quorum, and we've got uh, we have several bills before us. Uh, I guess six. No, that, that counts to call call to order. We've done that. So five, five bills, and uh, we're going to start with uh, Senator Newton, Senate File 2878. Senator Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move uh, Senate File 2878 for possible inclusion. So move. This bill is uh, for $6.5 million from the RDA in fiscal year 23 for a demonstration geothermal energy project grant to the Anoka Hennepin School District at the Soderberg uh, Early Childhood Learning Center in Coon Rapids. <clears throat> the facility is used year round. So the project would provide for both heating and cooling for the many children and families that access uh, the Soderberg Learning Center. Uh, Noka Hennepin School District, as my colleague uh, Senator Hoffman often reminds us, is the largest school district in the state. We have uh, 50 schools and uh, four administrative and warehouse buildings in the district, uh, which stretches actually from Brooklyn Center to Ramsey and includes both the XL and Conexus uh, energy providers. Although Soderberg is in the Conexus service uh, area, the district pays Excel a large amount of money every month for the service that pr they provide to the schools in their area. Uh, I have uh, as a testifier Mr. Tony Poole, who is from the um, Pipefitters Local 455, and I'm hoping that Mr. Poole is available. Uh, Hi. Mr. Yes, I'm, Mr. Poole, are you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, my name is Tony Poole. I'm the business manager of the St. Paul Steam Fitters Pipe Fitters Local 455. Um, I was asked to testify, I think, uh, maybe just because uh, we recently did a project on, at our training center that involved geothermal technology. Um, just kind of wanted to speak to the, the, uh, the fact that, you know, geothermal, a lot of people uh, know that it's been around for a long time, and it has. Um, but the technology has drastically changed from when it was, you know, first started getting used years and years ago. And, uh, you know, a bill like this, I think, could help uh, promote uh, some of this cleaner energy in the heating and cooling uh, industry, especially within schools. Um, heating and cooling costs, you know, they're the, they're the highest costs that any building owner has when operating a building, whether it's a school or any building. Um, so, you know, a system like ours, uh, we actually place an exchanger in the aquifer and it just uses the temperature of the aquifer to supply our building with 52 degree water, which is uh, suffice for uh, comfort cooling. Um, it can also be used for heating with a heat pump. Um, we've had studies through XL Energy on our savings that we'll have on our 100,000 square foot building. And we're in the near 85% savings on our cooling costs. And uh, probably about 30, 30 some percent on our heating costs. So those are huge savings. And you know, when you're talking about using them in a school, those are all savings that go back. I would think I'm not an expert in this field, but go back to the taxpayer, at least uh, what it costs to operate the school, since those are the two highest uh, things that it costs to run a building is the heating and cooling. So um, with that, I guess I'll, I'll ask if anybody has any questions about at least our system and um, geothermal. I'll answer the best I can. I'm not a mechanical engineer. Any, anybody uh, have any questions, members? Uh, I sense not. Uh, any questions of the author? And I sense uh, not. Uh, uh, any wrap-up comments, uh, Senator? No, Mr. Chair, thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify and to present this bill. And again, I ask that it be uh, laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Okay, with that then, Senate File 2878 is laid over for possible inclusion, and we will move on. Thank you, Senator Newton. And Senator Matthews, will you take the gavel? All right, Senator Senjem, a uh, few bills up. First, oh, thank you. 
First, Senate File 4089, Senator Senjum. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Senate uh, File 4089 has to do with solar on schools. It's a program that uh, is, uh, I think, somewhat familiar with the from the standpoint of uh, committee activity around here. Uh, we did, uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, fund this at, uh, at $8 million uh, last year for two years going forward. Uh, we had, uh, and, and, and this is, uh, and there's, there's two components of this, uh, those uh, inside the XL area and those outside. Uh, the area outside of the XL area, uh, we had pretty good, actually we had excellent response in terms of uh, uh, the uh, exceeding the, the dollar amount. Uh, we've, uh, we had requests for $11.8 million, so we, uh, we tipped that. And the Department of Commerce suggests to us that if we want to make the, uh, the program whole, at least from the standpoint of the application they received, uh, we would need to add an, another uh, $4.3 million. So, that, so that's what this bill suggests, at least for the year 2023. And then going forward with respect to uh, the subsequent years, it uh, would add uh, another $8 million for 24 and for 25 each $8 million. And that is, uh, that is outside of the XL area. And then uh, correspondingly in the inside of the XL area, if you will, uh, an equal amount, $4.3 million to match the, the, uh, the uh, Excess or the additional money would be given to the outside, plus again uh, another combination of eight and eight for 20, uh, let's see, for 24 and 25. And the base then at fiscal year 26 would be zero. Uh, and any money that uh, is left over from at least the RDA portion of that would cancel back to the RDA, uh, uh, obviously. I, I think that's the essence of the bill. I know we have some witnesses. Uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, we can perhaps hear from them, or, or if there are any questions at this point, we'll try to answer them. I have uh, Logan O'Grady first on my list, followed by Braden Solom and Rick Evans. Uh, if you'd identify yourself for the record, and then feel free to begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. For the record, Logan O'Grady, Executive Director of the Minnesota Solar Energy Industries Association. I think you're all familiar with Mincia, but I'm new here, and so if you're not, um, we are a 501 C6 trade organization with over 140 diverse members who employ over 4,500 Minnesotans throughout the state. We work to move Minnesota solar plus energy storage forward through pro-business, pro-job growth, and pro-economic development policies that enable our members to meet payroll, grow long-term in our communities, and hire more Minnesotans throughout the state. Our members compete in a 50-state market, and we want them to choose Minnesota over anywhere else to do business. Thank you, Senator Senjum, for authoring this bill. As we did last year, we support this bill this year. It's been extremely successful uh, throughout the state, uh, extremely popular in many different school districts. So uh, thank you for the support on that. Also, thank you to Excel, who has worked with us on multiple occasions to make sure we roll out the program in their territory uh, well. I can stick around for questions, but just wanted to voice our support for this bill. Thank you. And Mr. Solom, welcome uh, to the committee. Please identify yourself on the record and then begin. My name is Braden Solom. I'm a Vice President of Business Development at Ideal Energies. Uh, chair, members of the committee, thank you for, for having me here today. Um, Ideal Energies, we are a commercial solar company that focuses on developing projects for Minnesota's public sector. Uh, specifically, we work closely with many school districts to develop on-site rooftop solar projects on school buildings that directly offset their utility expense. I thank you for allowing me to speak in support of Senate File 4089 and the additional funding of the Solar for Schools programs. And I also want to thank Senator Sendrum here uh, for bringing this bill forward. I'll speak separately about the Solar for Schools programs located outside Excel and that is administered by the Department of Commerce. And then I'll talk about the Excel Energy uh, solar for Schools program. First, the Solar for Schools program for utilities located outside of Xcel Energy Territory opened for readiness applications in January. There was such significant interest in this program that the Department of Commerce had, had to limit applications to two projects per district. For many districts located outside of Xcel Energy Territory, there has been little to no opportunity to install commercial solar arrays 
due to the lack of incentive programs that make these projects financially feasible. For many, the Solar for Schools program is the first time they have been able to explore on-site solar for their school buildings. From our experience working with districts so far, we have found that many have been waiting for an opportunity like this and are excited to participate. With the ample demand for solar grants, this year's funding for the program is likely already allocated within the first round of applications, and we anticipate there is more than enough demand for the program to utilize all potential funding for the program as allocated in Senate File 4089. Secondly, in regards to the Excel Energy Solar for Schools program, from speaking with eligible school districts, we are predicting that there is interest in this program and we will anticipate that all funding will be allocated rapidly for each school year um, as described in the bill uh, with significant demand from districts that qualify as low income, which is defined by having 50% or more free and reduced price lunges under the uh, national school lunch program per building. We also have appreciated the opportunity to work with XL Energy to ensure that districts are not disqualified from existing long-term programs they are entitled to when participating in the Solar for Schools program. This has resulted in a solution that maximizes the outcome for, par for participating districts, and the program has now been approved by the Public Utilities Commission to move forward. As you can see, both of the Solar for School programs are primed for success. Outside of Excel territory, it has offered many districts their first opportunity to install solar, and they are excited and ready to participate. In Excel territory, it offers significant financial outcomes for participating districts, especially districts that qualify as low income. The result of these programs is a significant reduction in the cost of energy uh, to participating districts for years to come. Thank you. All right, thank you. And next up is Rick Evans from Xcel Energy. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Rick Evans with Xcel Energy. Uh, I'm, I'm th and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the committee briefly today. Uh, XL Energy has some concerns with Senate File 4089, uh, principally the fact that the XL Energy program that's just been described has not started yet. Uh, last year, as Senator Senjum pointed out, there was $8 million allocated from the RDA, uh, which I, the committee should recall is collected from our customers exclusively, uh, to start the Solar on Schools program. Ours is a little bit behind the state program because we have more regulatory hoops to jump through uh, at the Public Utilities Commission, which is appropriate to make sure that the money is being spent responsibly uh, by a public utility. That's what the PUC is there for. So the program will commence in May. Uh, I would respectfully suggest that we see how the program works in XL Energy Service ter Territory before we start appropriating more money. Nothing has changed since last year when the $8 million was appropriated uh, to today. Uh, and once we start the program, we will see how it goes. It's important to note that unlike the rest of the state, XL Energy Service Territory has been putting solar on schools for many years now. We have 170 schools that have solar on their roofs. That was done through the Solar Rewards Program, which is also money taken from our customers for a subsidy. Uh, for private nonprofit business, or I should say private for-profit businesses that sell this service. Uh, and that program, along with the PV demand credit, which we've had some talk about here, has, which is also only available in XL Energy Service Territory, has already provided significant incentives and subsidies for school districts to place solar on their rooftop. So with respect to this program, again, I would respectfully request that the committee consider whether this is the time to add three more years and an additional $20 million of our customers' money to incentivize a program that, uh, that we, don't, we haven't had a year, we haven't had any operation of yet. Uh, there's plenty of time to come back next year if this turns out to be such a boon. Uh, I would also suggest that, you know, perhaps the developers of these projects should be required to come in and maybe show a little more due diligence to the committee about how the money's being spent, how the program works, how the subsidies are being provided to our, to our customers before they come in and ask for another $20 million. Uh, so I understand this is going to be laid over for inclusion in the omnibus bill, and we're happy, of course, to sit down with Senator Senjum and any of the proponents of this to see if there's some reason why 
Uh, we should suddenly increase the amount of money that was appropriated last year, but uh, without that, I would uh, urge the committee to uh, consider that, that this is not the time to make this change. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Uh, is there any question or discussion from committee members? Seeing none, uh, Senator Senjum, any final comments? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the bill is as it is, uh, just based on the thought that uh, we sort of started this last year that uh, we, you know, we have equals in terms of inside of the XL area and outside of the XL area. Uh, we, we know that outside of the XL area, uh, there's every indication that the interest is strong. Uh, we don't know, of course, uh, that uh, within the uh, within the inside of the XL area. I guess we'll find out. Uh, the bill is written so that if the money is not spent, of course, it does uh, return to the renewable development account after five years, or for that matter, the legislature could move it back before that. So, uh, but beyond that, I think you know it's. Uh, I think it, you know it's, it's solar on schools is important. It's uh, from the standpoint of educating our, 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 our youth, if you will, in, in, in energy options. And so that's why we bring it forward. And uh, Mr. Chair, I'd appreciate uh, uh, the committee's attention to this. And uh, if we could set it aside for possible inclusion, uh, that would be wonderful. With that, Senate File 4089 is laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, next, I believe you have Senate File 4119. Yes, I, uh, you ready, Mr. Chair? I'm sorry. Senator Sanjum. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, uh, and uh, yes, 40, 4019 is... Uh, Another bill that's been around here, it's uh, sort of, uh, again, renewal, renewal, extension, and so on, relative to something we call the Solar Rewards Program. Uh, this particular bill adds uh, to the allotment uh, that uh, we had put into the bill last year. It, uh, it, it adds an additional $5 million uh, for 2023, another $5 million for 2024, and then subsequently for 25 and 6, each $10 million for that. In addition to that, uh, this is somewhat new, and we might want to talk about this. Uh, there's a uh, energy storage incentive program that's uh, new to uh, this committee uh, that is included, and uh, that would be, again, from the renewable development account, uh, $10 million. And there are criteria within the bill that establish, uh, you know, the specifics about the storage program. So that is the essence of this bill, and uh, we can. Uh, Proceed with witnesses if you'd like, unless there are any questions. Thank you, Senator Senjum. Uh, we have Mr. O'Grady back again to speak to this, and then Mr. Michael Allen. Mr. Hello O'Grady, again. if you'd state your name for the record again, and welcome back. Hello again, Mr. Chair Logan O'Grady, the Executive, Executive Director of Mincia, um, here again to support this bill. We have seen the success of the solar rewards program throughout the state. I think it's important to remember that all of these policies that we are discussing today are market signals to states throughout the country and businesses throughout the country who are looking for good places to do business, good places to hire uh, individuals, uh, create jobs, grow their businesses and communities and invest there. Uh, this has been one that has been successful through the years of doing that. Um, showing people that Minnesota is a great place to do business for solar companies. That's why it's been so successful. So that's why we've continued to extend it throughout the many years and why we support extending it again. Because it has been so successful, we recommend uh, empl employing that same strategy to a new smaller market, which is the energy storage market that we're looking at. Energy storage will help us build the grid of the 21st century. That will be a more resilient grid, a more secure grid, a more reliant grid, and any way that we can incentivize the growth of that industry will create jobs here and create that grid. So happy to stick around for questions again, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Mr. O'Grady. Uh, Mr. Allen, are you in the room or are you online? Hi, uh, Chair Senjum. There, this is Michael Allen. I'm online. All right. Uh, welcome to the committee. If you would state your name for the record and then feel free to begin your testimony. Sure. Uh, my name is Michael Allen. Um, I'll jump right into it. Chair Senjum and the members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to share our story with you today. Uh, my name, again, as I mentioned, is Michael Allen. I'm the CEO of St. Paul-based All Energy Solar. Our organization was started by my brother and I 12 years ago. Every year, we've organically grown our business, and I'm proud to share that we currently employ over 200 people and are currently expanding our organization by an additional 72 in 2022. As of actually earlier today, uh, we had hired our 38th new employee for 2022, uh, and our goal is to hire an additional 34 open roles before the end of the third quarter. Uh, I want to clarify these. These are not temporary jobs that we're hiring for. Uh, these aren't for a single project. These are full-time project managers, designers, engineers, uh, accountants, um, local Minnesotans. Um, the first purpose of sharing this details is to remember that clean energy policy and, uh, and funding provides jobs. And that's something that I, I, I believe we can all get behind. In addition to creating uh, new jobs, uh, I wanted to share some of the economic activity that is generated by providing a clear, concise funding roadmap uh, between our company and the other 20 local solar companies or so, um, we will generate hundreds of millions of dollars of local Minnesota economic activity. Um, here's a good way to think of it. So the average rebate check um, that a solar rewards customer that they receive annually is about $320. Um, that project, uh, once they sign up, is then designed by a local Minnesota uh, graduate from the University of Minnesota Architecture Program. Um, the management of that project is done by a local Minnesotan. Uh, a significant amount of the material for that project is purchased from local Minnesota companies, um, which is then installed in local Minnesotan tradespeople. Um, then once everything is complete, our local Minnesotan neighbor that has uh, installed solar gets to save 10, 20, or $100 on their electric bill. Uh, and that money then recirculates back into our local Minnesota economy. Uh, and all of this activity is generated via a very small solar rewards rebate. Another area that I thought would be helpful to explain is how the solar rewards program uh, is getting more efficient and we're getting essentially more bang for our buck. Um, Starting four years ago, uh, the residential customer received a, a rebate of about eight cents a kilowatt hour. Three years ago, that rebate um, dropped to seven cents. And now today, that same customer would only receive four cents. Um, in just a few years, we have decreased the amount that any individual received in approximately half. And in addition, 10 to 20% of all the total solar rewards funds are now set aside for income qualified candidates. Uh, we plan to continue uh, on a path to lowering the cost barriers of going solar while providing local resilient clean energy solutions for Minnesota. Uh, solar rewards program is working uh, and, and we wanna continue with that. With that, um, thank you for the opportunity. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Appreciate your testimony. And then next, uh, Mr. Evans is on the list to come back up. Welcome back to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Rick Evans with Excel Energy. Uh, my remarks are gonna be somewhat similar, but this program is, is different, and so th there will be some differences here. Uh, as the, from, from what I said in the Solar on Schools program. Uh, this program, it's worth remembering, was uh, created in the 2013 legislative session. There was $5 million a year allocated for uh, 2014 through 2019. Uh, almost every 
year or every other year since then, the program has been increased or extended. Uh, with this uh, bill, uh, 4119, being just the latest extension, uh, adding $30 million over the next four years to continue this program, adding two years to the program, and adding $10 million to the amount that was appropriated for 23 and 24, which was just appropriated last year. Uh, nothing really has changed since last year in the program, and yet here we are back asking XL Energy customers to pitch in another $10 million to support subsidies for rooftop solar. What's lacking in the conversation uh, is any demonstration of need, any demonstration that this subsidy that's now been going on for almost 10 years needs to go on at these levels for another three years or four years. Uh, what's lacking is any showing of the value that's been delivered, any of the economics, any of the uses of the money that's been done over the last 10 years. We've spent tens of millions of dollars of XL Energy customers' money on the Solar Rewards Program. And today, the advocates walk in, they give five minutes of testimony and expect that, the, that we're going to hand another $30 million over to them. Where's a track record? Where's a showing that this is worth it anymore? We've heard testimony that the cost, that the amount of subsidy that's provided to customers is going down, and yet the amount of money that they're asking for is going up. Where's the end to this? What's the end game? When do we get to the point where these for-profit companies have to stand on their own two feet and sell their product to customers based on the value that they deliver? Why are XL Energy customers now committed in 2026? What's it going to look like in 2026? But $10 million is going to flow from XL Energy customers to support these for-profit companies that apparently are unable to sell their product in the market without the subsidy. There is probably information that could be had and a good discussion that could be had, similar to what we had in 2013, about why this program needs to continue. But we're not getting that. And we haven't had it for, for several years. We come in and we just continue to add to the program and spend more of XL Energy customers' money to support a program without any demonstration that this is still required after 10 years. So again, we would respectfully ask the committee uh, to consider whether they, we need to continue this program or whether there should at least be some demonstration that the program has to continue or people will no longer be able to put solar on their rooftop in XL Energy service territory. Uh, there must be some demonstration that these for-profit companies are unable to stand on their own two feet after all these years. Uh, if that demonstration can be made, that's great. Let's see it. But to just come in and ask for another $30 million for a program because the program has been around for 10 years doesn't make sense. There's nothing innovative about putting solar panels on people's rooftops. It's not what the renewable development account was meant for, to just pri provide an ongoing subsidy to private businesses uh, that provide energy savings to a tiny subset of our customers. There's a lot of innovation to be had out there, but it's not in rooftop solar. And now we've got $10 million for batteries. Again, with, with absolutely no testimony as to what a battery does for a homeowner or a small business, without any testimony about how much they cost, without any testimony about how much the subsidy is going to be for these, none of that. We just get, we need $10 million to put batteries in people's basements to help support the solar panels they put on their roof. Perhaps there's this argument to be made for, for subsidizing batteries, but the argument hasn't been made. And we need, we would request that the committee consider that and consider that before we start handing out tens of millions of dollars of XL Energy customers' money, we at least see what the program's going to look like, why it's needed, and what the value is that's going to be provided to the customers who are paying for it. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any discussion from committee members? Senator Senjim, do you have any final comments yourself? Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I think uh, Mr. Evans make, you know, certainly makes some points. Uh, 
uh, it, it is somewhat, you know, I think difficult to make these kind of assessments. We, you know, the, the, the money is there, and, and, and I, I even personally wish there were something more novel than rooftop solar to, to spend it on. And it doesn't mean that uh, when I say that, that, uh, that, uh, that, that this is necessarily a bad thing either. Uh, but it, it, it is there. These are programs which I think have worked. We, we heard the testimony with respect to the economic uh, the virtues of, of this from at least the one solar developer in Minnesota. Uh, and uh, the, the idea here is to certainly set it aside for possible inclusion and, and have some more of these conversations. So that would be my hope for today. All right. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we will lay Senate File 4119 over for possible inclusion. The next one up, Senate File 4262, Senator Senjum. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, once again. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll move off uh, solar panels and get to <laughs> something called securitization. Uh, and, uh, and this, by the way, members, is, uh, is all about, uh, is all about uh, you know, natural gas, gas bills, heating bills. And so securitization is uh, somewhat of a new term, at least certainly even, even for myself. Uh, but it's an important tool that uh, could be available to benefit and protect customers against uh, so-called bill shock in the event uh, of a unique uh, case of, uh, of which is extraordinary and, and might cause unavoidable costs to, to customers that, uh, from the standpoint of their heating bills. It could be a, a natural disaster. It could be a, an error, a flaw, i.e. the Texas incident a couple of years ago that led to uh, concern, cybersecurity, uh, so on and so forth, uh, all kinds of uh, possibilities, at least, that might lead to uh, a, a bump or a shock, if you will, in somebody's uh, home heating rates. Uh, I think this legislation would be win-win for Minnesota. It uh, would make a customer's bill more affordable and allowing utilities then uh, over a period of time, as opposed to having to deal with, with some level of immediacy, uh, recover their costs. And there's certainly public accountability and regulatory oversight in this uh, particular document, this uh, Senate file 4262. The, uh, the securitization is, is basically spreading it out, spreading the, uh, the cost out over a longer period of time, more than likely around 20 years, by the gas company, in this case, bonding, uh, and their quality bonds, they're certainly guaranteed uh, by virtue of the, uh, of the Public Utilities Commission decree, probably in some sort of a AAA bond rated uh, bond, and thus uh, relatively low cost. Uh, 26 states have done this in some form. It's a proven option, I think, uh, and it, again, can save customers uh, a great deal of money uh, as we get into the possibility of uh, uh, potential spikes in, in home heating bills, as frankly we're occurring right now. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I think I'm just going to stop there uh, and bring forth my testifiers, and we can deal with a little bit more I have in my script if we need to towards the end. But why don't we bring uh, Mr. Jason, uh, Jason uh, Ryan forward. Uh, he is with uh, CenterPoint Energy, and uh, allow him to testify as well as anybody else that uh, might be on our list. All right. Mr. Ryan can come forward, and Senator Senjum, I also believe you have an A-1 amendment. Oh, I'm sorry. I do. I have, I have an A-1 amendment to get this bill in order. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Senjum moves the A-1 author's amendment. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion prevails. All right, Mr. Ryan, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record and then begin your testimony, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Matthews. My name is Jason Ryan. I'm with Centerpoint Energy here to testify in favor of this house file. It's an honor to be with you all today and to have visited with you over the last couple of days. As you may know, we have the privilege to serve about 900,000 homes and businesses with natural gas service here in Minnesota. 
throughout other parts of the Midwest and down to the Gulf of Mexico, we serve over 5 million other homes and businesses with either gas utility service or electric utility service. And in some of those other jurisdictions, we have implemented legislation like the legislation before you today, and it's with that experience that we bring to the table and, and testify in support of this bill. Uh, Senator Syndrome did a good job of laying it out. Maybe I'll, I'll take some time and discuss three things, maybe a little bit more about what securitization is. Uh, number two, our experience with it over the last 20 years. Uh, and number three, how it's used uh, elsewhere across the country. So first, what securitization is. Uh, it is, as the Senator mentioned, a way to get low cost financing for often one time large cost to save customers money versus traditional utility financing. And I should say before I, I go too far into this that it's also a pleasure to be testifying uh, alongside one of our consumer interest representatives, the Citizens Utility Board. It's not every day that we are aligned in, in how we see things uh, best for our business and, and best for customers, but that is true here today. And it's been true in our experience in, in other states. This is a, uh, a way for customers' bills to be lowered. It's a tool in the toolbox for stakeholders in the PUC to consider. And as with most things, having more tools in the toolbox is good, especially when it's a tool to reduce customer bills. Uh, but it's not a silver bullet. There are rarely those things in life, right? So it won't make sense in every situation in our experience, it, it makes the most sense when all stakeholders and our state commissions are on board with using it. In our view, it's a tool that you hope you never need because as we mentioned, it, these are for unexpected, one-time, large things. So you hope that you never need it, um, but you want to have it there because it's an even worse situation to need the tool and not have it. And we've been in that situation in one of our states as well. So maybe let me give a simplified example of why there are customer benefits to this way of financing costs. Let's say something unexpected happens. It could be a natural event. It could be uh, a terrorist attack on infrastructure. It could be any number of things. And let's say that that event costs me $100 million. So I will spend that $100 million on behalf of my customers to continue providing them gas utility service. And I have today, uh, without this legislation, have really two sources of funds to pay that $100 million. I can go to a bank and borrow money on a long-term basis at, say, 4 to 6% interest. And obviously, those numbers uh, vary depending on market conditions. I also have the ability, if I don't want to go borrow money from a bank and take on that debt, I have the ability to issue company stock. You can be a shareholder in Centerpoint Energy. You give me money in exchange for stock and you have equity interest in my company. Uh, equity owners would be looking for something greater than 4 to 6%, say 9 to 10%. So that is a more expensive way for me to get that dollar. Uh, because I can't take on 100% debt for all of my obligations, I would probably do some combination of those two uh, and get a weighted average cost of, of that money at, say, 6.5%. What securitization allows us to do is instead issue low-cost AAA-rated bonds in the 1% to 2% interest range and save money for our customers. We also save money at our company and can use that money to continue to invest um, in a modernized gas utility system. Getting that AAA bond rating is... Uh, only achievable because of the statutory framework. Uh, if we could do that on our own, we wouldn't be uh, taking up your time today. It's important that that statutory framework is there because it creates a charge on our customer's bill that is dedicated to paying off this thing that happened. Uh, and it is that revenue stream that serves as security for the bond offering, thus the term securitization. Second, let me speak briefly to how it's been used across the country. As Senator Sinjim mentioned, it's uh, been adopted in majority of states. It really goes back to the late 1990s. Uh, and it has been almost exclusively used um, for things, like I mentioned before, at a high level, one-time significant things. Um, 
because it is a cheaper way to finance those costs. Uh, so while the, the thing that's being financed may differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, the process is often the same. The utility goes to the State Public Utility Commission, has a very transparent process on quantifying the benefits to customers. Uh, stakeholders take a look at that. Um, the commission takes a good hard look at that and confirms that there are quantifiable, confirmed benefits to customers of using this method of financing. And it's, it's extremely transparent. Like I mentioned, while the process may be the same and similar subject matters, it's not a silver bullet. There have been times where uh, we and other stakeholders have chosen uh, to go the traditional financing route uh, because there are times where that is a better solution than using securitization financing. As I mentioned before, let me get to my third point, how, how we've used it, and I'll give you a specific example. And again, it's, it's best when all stakeholders agree uh, and the commission agrees that this is the right path forward. Um, down in one of our southern states, we had uh, hurricane damage to electric utility assets to the tune of about $700 million. So again, that's consistent with large, one-time, unexpected costs. Uh, and the commission, after looking at our application, and stakeholders, after looking at our application, decided securitization was the best way to recover those costs. In fact, it saved customers more than $300 million versus traditional utility financing. So the customer savings uh, with these transactions versus traditional methods can be very significant. So like I mentioned at the beginning, securitization is a tool that's best to be had and never needed, but you don't want to need it and not have it. In, in the example of the storm cost, uh, $700 million that were incurred, we did not have securitization as a tool. Um, all of our stakeholders wished that we did. We had to wait for the legislature to come back into session uh, before we could bring those benefits to our customers. So you don't want to be in the situation of needing it and not having it, in our opinion. And like I mentioned, it's not a silver bullet. It, can't, it won't be the right answer in every situation, but it's always better to have more tools in the toolbox. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Uh, next up is Annie Levison Falk. Are you in the room here, or perhaps you're online? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm online today. All right. If you would uh, state your name for the record and then begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Matthew, Senator Benjamin, members. My name is Annie Levinson Falk. I'm Executive Director of the Citizens Utility Board, uh, a nonprofit advocate for Minnesota utility customers. And I can keep this very brief. I just want to uh, add help support for the bill um, to make securitization available in Minnesota to help protect gas customers from drastic bill hikes due to extreme events that could occur in the future. Um, as Mr. Ryan, um, he covered the bill in detail, and I, I'll try not to go over anything that he's already said, um, but it's a tool that's in use in, in many other states, and I understand has helped to drastically cut bill impacts from things like extreme weather events. Um, I'm sure that securitization won't be the best solution in every case, but it'd be useful to have on hand in case um, it was needed in the future to be able to spread out costs that are unanticipated and from extraordinary events um, to do so over a longer period of time with a, a low interest rate. So on behalf of Cub, I just want to say thank you to Senator Sengem and to Center Point for bringing the bill forward. Thank you, Ms. Levitson falk uh, So members will go to questions from the committee. Uh, Mr. Ryan, um, you went into it a little bit, but this was kind of my questions on first read through of the issue is trying to picture and obviously, I, you know, I, I don't pretend to be an expert in the world of financing and financing law, but uh, what the need was for, was there something, uh, something avoidable in the last few years we're trying to do? What I'm kind of hearing you say is you're looking, I mean, an analogy that might make sense to me is you're looking to get an insurance policy that your customers are paying for up front in the event something happens down the road. Is that is that an accurate analogy on my part? Is there uh, something more to it in, as I'm trying to contemplate what this bill is and what its purpose is? 
thank you, Mr. Chairman. So customers won't pay anything if this bill passes unless uh, and until some event happens um, where stakeholders and the commission and us uh, agree that securitization is the right path forward to finance it. So this is not something you're doing up front uh, in the future just in case this would be something after a traumatic event of some sort that's already impacted you that you bring this tool to the commission as an option for how to how to deal with the financial impact. That's Is that correct? Chairman Matthews, yes, you're right. This bill does not set up a reserve fund, so to speak, um, that we could access in the event something happens. Our customers would only see a charge from this kind of a financing in the event that um, an event happens in the future, the commission approves this use of financing uh, and determines that this is a better way of paying for the event versus the traditional way. We hope that we never have to use it. All right. Any other discussion? Senator Frentz. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Sengen, for bringing this forward. Appreciate your testimony. Mr. Ryan, um, the prudence review, um, when you get to that point, would you mind sharing with the committee some of the factors that the PUC might look at in determining prudence um, and maybe share with us a little bit more about what that looks like? Thank you. Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Senator, yes. Uh, so it, it will depend depend you know, on the type of cost that you're looking at. Uh, if you're looking at capital costs, say it's a, a, an uninsured um, piece of utility property that's used to provide service um, and, and it is destroyed. Let's say it's our downtown Minneapolis headquarters and there is no insurance on it. There is, but let's just use that as an example. Um, the, the prudence of that investment will have been looked at previously. And let's say uh, the building is destroyed, it had a, a value on our books of $50 million and it costs $75 million to replace it. Um, so here we'd be looking at, instead of continuing to recover that $50 million in customer rates going forward um, at say a 9% uh, return on the equity investment, we would pull it out of rates issue bonds and recover that $50 million at, say, 2% interest over the remaining life of that building. Uh, and that 7% that, uh, interest delta on $50 million, which will be a lot, um, is what the benefit is. There's not really a prudence review associated with that asset because it was already reviewed. Let's take an example, a different example, and say it's a cyber attack on a pipeline that brings gas to us so that we can turn around and deliver that gas to our customers. Let's say there's some cyber event, uh, that pipeline is no longer operating. You know, that happened with the Colonial Pipeline uh, down in the south. Let's say it happens here. Uh, and that causes the market price for natural gas to go up significantly. Um, very similar to what happened with Hurricane Uri, very different causes, but a similar outcome, higher commodity costs. There, I think there is a, a, an aggressive prudence review done at the commission on those costs before they would be securitized. Uh, the commission would look at a number of factors, including you know, what, what I knew uh, before, during, and after that event, whether I acted prudently on my purchases on the pipeline that was no longer available to me, what I did to go buy gas from somebody else, did I prudently do that? So it really depends on the type of cost you're talking about. Sometimes there would be you know, a relatively limited prudence review if the asset's already been reviewed versus an aggressive uh, prudence review if the costs have never been looked at before. Senator Frentz. Thanks again, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks, Mr. Ryan. So the gist of it is when there is a need for an extensive prudence review, it's the imprudent part that we're watching uh, because that relates to the ability to recover. Is that about it? Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe that's right. You know, so we should not recover imprudent costs. Uh, and so that review at the commission would determine is 100% of this recoverable, is 95% of it recoverable, or some other percentage. And you would only securitize 
whatever was determined to be prudent. You would never recover your imprudent costs, nor, sh nor should we, in, under any method that I've described. Yeah. All right, thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, Senator Senjum, any final comments? Uh, no, thank you, uh, and uh, thank you for a good discussion, uh, Mr. Chair, that uh, be the desire that this be uh, set aside for possible inclusion. All right, with that, Senate File 4262 is laid over for possible inclusion. Would you like me to kick off the next Thomasoni bill, Senator Senjum? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. uh, next up is Senate File 3838. Uh, it's Senator Thomasoni. Senator Senjum, you must be presenting it as well. I, I am on uh, for Senator Thomasoni, and uh, I, I don't have my screen in front of me. Last I knew, Senator Thomasoni was with us. So uh, welcome, Senator Thomasoni. It's good to have you here. Uh, and it's uh, a privilege to present uh, your bill uh, uh, to this afternoon. So, uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, there's an A2 amendment uh, that we might start with, if we could. Senator Senjum offers the A2 amendment. It's a delete everything amendment, and it is an author's amendment. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The amendment is adopted. Senator Senjum. So, Mr. Chair and members, this bill does two things. I'm going to be uh, fairly brief on it uh, because it, uh, Mr. Solom, to my uh, right, is uh, going to take it into a little more detail. But uh, this bill uh, is, is another, if you will, form of uh, providing cost relief to uh, customers that uh, may be incurring uh, high heat bills by virtue of uh, of some incident, and uh, it does it, if I didn't say it, through a tax credit mechanism. In addition to that, it uh, provides uh, an amount of money uh, uh, at $35 million in this bill that would go to uh, assist uh, municipal uh, gas utilities in, uh, in uh, relative to reserve, uh, to their rebuilding their reserves, which they depleted the last, uh, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago with the with the Texas incident. So I'm going to stop there and uh, refer to uh, Mr. Solom, who can carry this bill into uh, a little deeper water. Mr. Solom, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record and then begin. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Ken Solom, Director of Government Relations and Senior Counsel for the Minnesota Municipal Utilities Association. <laughs> Sorry, I, my voice has become weaker and weaker, so I'll try to uh, be loud enough. Uh, section one, of the <coughs> section one of the bill, as I can hear the E two amendment, is a provision that's actually <coughs> that actually is an I O U provision, uh, but we didn't object to it being added to the Thomasoni bill uh, underlying uh, efforts here by the municipal operators. It creates a program uh, by which they can help their uh, ratepayers when there's some extreme cases of, of extra costs. Uh, by developing a program that they work with the Department of Commerce on, file it with the uh, PUC, and then they can use it for their customers as needed. Section two of the bill is where you start with the municipal operations. And this is related to our expenses that occurred uh, during the polar vortex of February 2021. And the section really does two things. One, it creates a center to, uh, center to indicate it a pot of money by which the utility themselves can get reimbursed uh, for expenditures made trying to keep the costs down for the customers. Um, a number of our municipal utilities encountered year, a year's budget being spent in a matter of two to three days during the peak of the vortex. And many of them spent some of their reserves that were intended to do upgrades and uh, capital investments towards trying to keep the costs down for the consumers. This would help make those uh, utilities whole. It would also create tax credit for the individual customers, uh, whereby we would certify the amount of extra payment that was incurred by the customers, and they would be able to claim a tax credit uh, for that. They are not allowed to double dip, so they've already used a business uh, exemption of some sort for the increased expense. They would not be able to get the tax credit. It's one or the other. Um, and that uh, centers or is the simplicity of the of the bill. We do have a couple of municipal operators uh, to provide. 
specific information of their, their stories that were incurred. I should mention that uh, this could have been a lot worse. Uh, we were very fortunate that about half the municipal operators received their gas from Canadian pipelines that were not affected by the vortex. And so that kept the cost down for us. All right, thank you, Mr. Sulem. So next on my list, uh, David Olson from the Oatana Public Utilities. Hello, um, thank you. My name is uh, Dave Olson and I'm the Director of Finance and Administration at Oatana Public Utilities. And the February 2021 natural gas pricing event dramatically impacted OPU and our 12,000 customers. OPU's natural gas cost for February of 2021 was an unprecedented $9.4 million, which was $8 million more than budgeted. This resulted in an average cost of $340 for each residential customer. To put that in perspective, the added cost of this five-day event was roughly two-thirds of our average an uh, customer's annual natural gas bill. To soften the impact on our customers, OPU used cash reserves to pay $8 million in higher natural gas cost, and then spread that billing to the customers over 12 monthly installments. Even when spread over 12 months, this caused further strain on many of our customers that were already experiencing financial impacts caused by the pandemic. I encourage your support of this bill. The funds would provide much needed relief to OPU customers who through no fault of their own were impacted by uncontrolled pricing of natural gas. Uh, and they needed that gas to heat their homes and businesses during a cold Minnesota winter. I appreciate your consideration and uh, will be available for any questions if they come up. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Uh, next up, uh, Luke Peterson from the Hibbing Public Utilities. Thank you, Chair Matthews, Senator Senjem, and Senator Tomasoni. Thank you so much for authoring this bill on behalf of Giving Rate Payers. Um, as uh, the previous testifiers have mentioned- You'd identify uh, yourself for the record, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Matthews. Uh, my name is Luke Peterson. I'm the general manager for Giving Public Utilities. Yeah, thank you, go ahead. All right. Um, as, uh, first of all, thank you to Senator Tomasoni, Senator Senjem, and uh, Chairman Matthews for uh, leading this uh, bill hearing today. As the previous testifiers have mentioned, the costs of the polar vortex were particularly hard on municipal customers who, unlike the uh, investor-owned utilities, you know, aren't obligated to have a, a profit margin and a cushion in their um, uh, reserves in a, in a way that uh, really can mitigate huge shocks like this. And if I could present uh, just one slide here, uh, do I have that ability? I believe you should. Uh, give it okay. a shot and let us know how it goes. Okay. Um, let's see here. Can you see my screen? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Well, um, I will email uh, you senators after the fact, but this chart that I have is a, um, it shows a, the gas prices that we received in Hibbing. We manage our portfolio prior to this with about a 30% floating mix of our gas supply because spot gas typically used to be very cheap and 70% was fixed pricing. Well, over the days of February in 2021, that price of gas escalated dramatically. And we made some changes within our uh, operations where we switched our power plant from running gas uh, to burning coal. It's a, it met, works on both coal, gas, and wood chips. And um, as a result, we were able to save about a million dollars for our customers, but our bill for Hibbing was $1.6 million extra for uh, no fault of our own. This is after the polar, this is after the COVID crisis was already affecting many Iron Rangers who were laid off or already having health problems uh, throughout this whole pandemic. This was a, a burden that was one too many for our customers. And uh, just the average gas bill for a giving person at the time was $500 for that month when it was normally uh, about a hundred. So, you know, that is quite as increased from normal. And, uh, you know, this 
unfortunately at the time had to be passed off just because as a municipal utilities, we manage our costs very low to ensure that we are um, uh, you know, helping our customers the best we can. I'm also joined with Derek Passy, who is a, uh, a counselor on the Two Harbor City Council who also was affected dramatically. And as Kent had man mentioned, uh, Northern Minnesota municipal utilities are highly susceptible to this. We are at the end of the line, at the end of the pipe. Uh, the Canadian pipelines don't reach our area. We are isolated. And as a result, we are dependent upon Northern Natural Gas's pipeline. And that's where the force majeure was declared. That's why we were so particularly hit. Uh, Councillor Passy, could I pass it over to you? Yes, he's next on my list. Oh, so, Mr. Right. Passy, uh, I believe I don't see you yet online. There you are. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please identify yourself and then feel free to begin. Thank you, Senator Mr. Matthews. My name is Derek Passy. I'm a city councilor for the city of Two Harbors. And the polar vortex caught me one month into my uh, term as city councilor in Two Harbors. And it was the first crisis that we had. And our utility costs for gas in 2021 were $1.3 million, as opposed to 200000 for the entire year in 2020. Uh, this was largely due to the polar vortex that struck in, in January, or February, pardon me, uh, Two Harbors is especially hard hit because 64% of our population is homeowners, uh, about a quarter of our population is seniors, and our housing stock, over 75% of it is, was built before 1980. So it was a combination of high fuel prices, uh, cost, cold temperatures, and uh, low uh, and lack of alternate sources of energy to, for heat. Uh, so I really, I hope that you support this tax share, uh, tax plan. The city did spread the billing out for all property owners for, the, for one fall year with no interest. And they did dip into their reserves to cover the cost in the interim. And right now the budget shows a negative shortfall uh, but most of our property owners have managed to uh, pay up their utility bills. Uh, typical utility bill was around the same as the uh, uh, tax stimulus that people got at the same time uh, in 2021, which was beneficial, but it was still, we heard that people were using their tax stimulus to pay for their utility bills. Thank you. Thank you, City Councilman Passy. Uh, appreciate your testimony. Uh, last on our list is Annie Levison Falk again. Uh, if you'd reintroduce yourself and then feel free to begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Tomasoni, Senator Senjamin, members. Again, I'm Annie Levinson Falk, Executive Director of the Citizens Utility Board of Minnesota. Um, Cub has heard probably from more people about the cost from Winter Storm Yuri than I think any other topic in the six years that we've been around. Um, these charges are, I mean, they're just difficult for some people and even more so combined with rising gas prices and other pressures that you all know that households are facing um, in terms of their budgets. Um, and it's just something that's made people upset, the idea that we in Minnesota are on the hook for costs that were caused because of poor planning in Texas or other southern states and through no fault of, of our own. Uh, but that's the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, so I imagine that you've probably heard from people about this bill or that, you know, once folks, once it becomes better known, it'll um, probably be getting people's attention. Um, with the investor-owned utilities, we've been able to work out some protections for customers, um, including exempting people who receive energy assistance um, from these charges and spreading the payments out over as much as 63 months. However, those these kinds of protections haven't been available to all municipal utility customers, and for various reasons, it's harder for municipal utilities to offer some of the flexibility that the investor-owned utilities can provide. Um, so. 
I think that this bill is going to provide some welcome relief to Minnesotans who get gas service from their local municipalities. Um, I haven't yet been able to fully digest the, the A2 amendment entirely, um, but certainly additional bill assistance would be helpful to a lot of um, customers of the investor-owned utilities too. And um, especially, I, I think, appreciate the inclusion of small business, which typically aren't included in energy assistance type of programs, but I think are facing a lot of pressures um, on energy costs and, you know, as you're all familiar with in, in other ways. Um, the scale of the total gas costs in Minnesota is really massive, though. I mean, we just use a lot of heat, and that means that if we're going to distribute assistance among all residential and small business customers, unfortunately, it would take a quite a sizable appropriation to make a noticeable impact. Um, so that points to, you know, maybe targeting assistance at the people in the businesses who um, would most benefit and maybe who are most harmed by rising prices, but also that can get administratively complicated. I don't have a specific proposal for you today. I just want to offer club support for the bill and the direction this is going. I imagine it's going to see more discussion as it moves forward. And if we can be of help as details are, are being hammered out, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you, Ms. Levison Falk. I know the next stop for this bill is going to be the Taxes Committee, so I think uh, some of these suggestions and topics are certainly pertinent there. Um, but are there any questions from members uh, to the author or any of the testifiers? And uh, I don't know if Senator Tomasoni, I believe you're online. I don't know if you had something you're preparing to say or not, but I. Uh, if you do, I definitely want to make sure uh, we have time for that. Um, you're still in our thoughts and prayers, and uh, we're uh, glad to hear this bill on your behalf for you. So seeing no discussion from anyone, uh, Senator Senjum. Uh, so I have been, uh, Mr. Chair, I've been pre-texting uh, uh, Senator Tomasoni, asking him what uh, he he wanted me to say on behalf of himself relative to this bill, and then in true Thomasoni fashion, he says, good bill. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the, the, those words uh, will, uh, you know, are typical Senator Thomasoni, and we, uh, we, we wish he was here today, and uh, I know he's watching, and for that we appreciate uh, his indulgence in this, in this hearing. Uh, so, Mr. Chair and members, uh, if we could, uh, uh, the motion would be to move Senate File 3838 uh, uh, to the Tax Committee with uh, a recommendation to pass. As amended. Uh, thank you. Senator Thomasoni is always short, sweet, and to the point. Uh, Senator Senjim moves that Senate File 3838, as amended, be recommended to pass and re referred to the Taxes Committee. Uh, members on Zoom, please turn your cameras on and unmute for the vote. All those in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion prevails and the bill is passed. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, that finishes the stack uh, for today. <laughs> Uh, we will meet again on Thursday, and uh, we'll be taking up uh, the omnibus bill. So look forward to everybody's participation in that. All right. Thank you, Senator Senjum. With that, you ready for me to adjourn? Go ahead. All right. This committee stands adjourned.